Uh, welcome everyone to another ACO. We this is the first of the uh, 2024 year. Uh, I'm excited, really excited about this. This is our first collaboration with uh, Montgomery Art Association uh, with our project that we do uh, every other Saturday morning, uh, hosting artists where they talk about their their work and their experiences in the in their particular field. Um, I'll introduce Jen Barlow, uh, president of the Montgomery Art Association, in just a second. Uh, but we want to say that our, our organization was originally sponsored by uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland State Art Council, uh, and then uh, sponsors just like you guys who come and attend the uh, ex or the uh, the presentation. Um, this uh, program was created by Mariana Castronakis and myself, and uh, it's free to everybody. So hopefully, uh, you guys can come back. We have another event in two weeks with um, um, uh, Nicole Santiago, who was the winner of the Bethesda Pain Awards last year. Uh, she's a fabulous painter. So this is a bi-weekly event. So everyone here can, of course, come to the next one uh, in two weeks on February 10th. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer Barlow, who's president of the Montgomery Art Association. She's going to tell you guys a little bit about uh, her amazing uh, role and uh, what uh, MAA does. Thank you, Jordan. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Barlow. I am the president of the Montgomery Art Association, and I know you're not here to see me, so I will keep this short. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Montgomery Art Association, or MAA for short. Um, the uh, MAA is a nonprofit organization supporting the visual arts and artists in Montgomery County um, in also the D.C. area. Uh, this year, we're actually celebrating our 70th birthday. So we've been around for a while. MAA offers tons of opportunities for our almost 500 members to display and sell their work. Um, for some of you who are in the area, you might know our largest and most popular show is our annual Paint the Town show in Kensington, Maryland. Um, in addition, we also offer field trips, plain air outings, business workshops, art-themed social events, and monthly meetings with noteworthy guest speakers like this one today. We are beyond thrilled to sponsor today's talk. Thank you, Jordan and Mariana in advance. Thank you, Christine, Nancy, Jill, and Stuart for imparting your wisdom on us this morning. So, take it away. Well, and one more thing before I introduce our, our, our main host for today. Uh, if you guys have, during the talk, have any questions, please type them into the chat and then Christine uh, or Mariana or I can kind of interject them into the discussion today. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows Christine Lashley, but uh, go ahead, Christine. Oh, stop, Jordan, please. <laughs> now, thank you, uh, Jen and Jordan so much and, and Mariana for uh, you know, collaborating and creating this uh, wonderful forum. I asked people that I knew from the plein air world that are working in the DC metro area, and I thought this would be great to show the diversity of we're going to be spanning the eastern shore, and I live in Virginia, and therefore this represents what is happening in our thriving area for the arts. And even though I'm kind of hosting it because I put together the, the panel, this is going to be held as rather a round robin of ideas. Uh, people are going to be welcome to type in questions and chat. We're, I'm going to be briefly talking about plein air in case somebody has joined and said, what's that weird term and why are they calling it that? I hope they define that in the beginning. And the plein air movement is a very thriving uh, art movement that is happening now. And I feel very fortunate to be part of this world. It's something I didn't set out to be part of that. I kind of scooted into it, as it were. I thought, this is really cool. There's a contest and there's prize money and maybe I could sell a painting and that would be great. And basically, plein air is a term that defines painting outside. And now the competitions have some fairly strict rules of you shouldn't work from photos, you must be present for certain events, you have to attend the opening, and also you have to create a certain amount of work. And sometimes you're required to give a demonstration to a crowd of people. And so with these events, uh, my friends that are on this show, uh, the other three artists have all participated for uh, 10, if not 20 years in these events. 
I've been active in the plein air world for 10 years now, at least. And uh, basically, it's I just feel very strongly that it has influenced all of the work that I have done. And that's that's what we're going to be talking about. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to, uh, and people can certainly chat and we can further describe this event and we will talk about uh, some of the nuts and bolts later when the discussion happens. Briefly, what we're going to do is introduce each artist and I'll show you their work and they will hop on and uh, tell you a bit about what Plan Air has meant to them. And we're going to be starting with Jill Basham. Hi. Hi, Christine. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having, having me. This is an honor to be part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> okay, here we've got, I mean, I was amazed when I saw this image. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how this commission came together? Uh, uh, well, I was asked to uh, to basically go to what, what the woman called, the very kind woman called a residency. Uh, and this happened to be in, um, in France, in the south of France. And this, this, uh, this is actually, so, okay, let me backtrack. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, she said, I, I will have a canvas there for you. Um, to paint plein air. So I brought my tripod and my uh, my paints and and was not expecting the um, the large size <laughs> of painting, uh, which I didn't mind because I do enjoy painting large even in plein air. So um, I had to figure out something other than the tripod. Uh, so in her garage, there were a couple of step ladders uh, and my husband, Ed, found some uh, crates to use, and we basically jerry-rigged um, up this easel so that I could use this large canvas and paint it, um, paint it on, you know, over, over numerous days, plein air, uh, looking at the view, which absolutely was uh, just stunning. Uh, I, I had the most fun doing it. Um, it was, it was... It was just quite an experience. <laughs> and this went on to win um, several awards too, right? You entered this online. I, yeah, I think, I think um, for the plein air salon, uh, Rose, Rose Franson gave it um, second place uh, for the plein air salon. And um, anyway, I, I, I just found, I, I don't, I'm, I can't remember what else, but uh, I, but I really did find joy in painting it. And um, boy, was that fun and so beautiful. I couldn't believe my luck. And um, when I walked out on their, their porch and saw the view that I was uh, going to be able to paint, it just blew me away. So I feel very fortunate. So Jill, you've been painting plein air for numerous years. You love big vistas. I've, I've seen you take a scene and do just incredible things with it. Um, somebody's written into the chat that uh, wh why would you, uh, it's it's part of, I, I think, our culture of seeing a photo and especially have you have it displayed here, it looks like a seamless view. So they're saying, what was your choice and not having clouds included in the image? The well, image. yeah, good question. So this was over uh, a, a week of every day, every afternoon, uh, going out and painting. And fortunately, the weather was pretty consistent. Uh, so the first day, uh, it was it was cloudless. And it had that what I uh, that sort of uh, Provence uh, blue, uh, Provence blue, Christine, you know how to say that. Yes. That's fine. Yes. Uh, Good job. That. And so what I was going for, and I love the clouds, I'm definitely a cloud um, person, but the the um, the intensity of that blue, I really wanted to capture that that I saw on the first day. So it's sort of the memory of, and that's what happens, I think, when you have plein air uh, paintings over days, is that you have to make a decision uh, about where you're going to leave it and try not to fall in love with something else that you're seeing, or even over hours, um, that, uh, you know, sticking to your original idea uh, is um, is something to uh, hold on to. 
That's a that's a great point. And I love that you described that that blue going into the distance was your kind of hook for basically this is a very <laughs> it's an audacious size, Jill. Good job. <laughs> I'm really impressed, especially thinking on your feet. You said the client brought the canvas too. So there's the question of texture and things like that that might trip you up. So amazing. You know, part part of what I love about plein air is that you always expect expect the unexpected, <laughs> which uh, you know ha happens to be weather. Uh, it's never exactly what you anticipate, which I find very exciting, and um, and so that's that's something that to embrace. I think is that whole what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a great point. And then you went from super big to tell us about this piece, because I think this is like eight by 10, right? And when yeah. we show. Yeah. Yes, it's an eight by 10 that was done uh, during Door County plein air. Uh, and I had gotten there and was very tired and, um, and uh, decided I just wanted to paint something very small and um, just do it the way I would like to do it and without thinking too hard about anything. And, um, and I, I, I was, I was happy with the expression and, um, and the idea of what I got down. I kind of like to not put a lot of render, a lot of detail and just put indications of things. And so, so I was pleased with it, but then I went large because that's what I like to do. And it ended up by the end of the week that, uh, this little one was, um, probably better, my better work compared to the other work that I had done in, in retrospect. So I've yeah. heard you describe that sometimes it's stressful to create the little one. Like for example, Easton requires you to create a six by eight and you're like, oh, I got to get that thing out of the way. <laughs> I think we all think that way. That, yes, that's true. Well, yeah, I, I, I do think that way, but um, also, but I think sometimes it's an opportunity to to really uh, get down a true plein air sketch uh, and really you're, you're um, without overthinking things. I think that it can be a, a you know, a, a treasure doing it, doing that, so. Wonderful. Well, yeah. is, um, if there's anything else you'd like to add about your plein air experience, but I think you covered a lot of things and um, then we'll move on to Stuart next, If uh, unless you have any final pieces of words on your um, collection of paintings here. No, no, I, no, but I'll, I'll chime in. If, <laughs> I'll chime okay. in. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Good. All right. Thanks so much, Jill. Thank you. We're going, oh, wait, we forgot this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's oh, no. see if it will play. I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, here's, uh, we interrupt this scheduled program <laughs> for a funny anecdote from <laughs> Easton. Yeah. Here's Jill painting. Target. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh. Um, I think that's, I, nice. I mean, how many artists have painted that? Nancy's painted that. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. it's, it, it's so unexpected. So I, I just, I'm amused by that because I was uh, standing next to the, the trucks that were, had their engines going the whole time. And I guess my, my thought with this is you never know where you're going to find an absolutely, you know, divine location. And uh, so, so don't, cross, you know, cross things off of your list or locations off of your list, um, just because they happen to be next to the target. <laughs> just, you know, keep an open mind because um, there's beauty everywhere. And, uh, and that was totally inspiring to me. Wonderful piece. Thank you. All right, Stuart, you're next on our agenda here. And uh, please tell us about your plenary work here. I'll be glad to. Thank you, uh, Christine. For, I really love that little uh, 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 video just now that just dovetails into what I like about plein air painting. Um, I thought what Jill's done there is if you didn't know the surroundings, you'd look at that painting and you'd say, what, uh, what a serene scene in the middle of nowhere. And yet there's the back of a 
giant retail shopping center right behind you. But that, that's that's fantastic. Um, I think what I love about um, plein air painting is that it is something you don't uh, overthink too much. That little six by eight study is exactly the kind of thing that I love about uh, plein air work is that it's, it's very fresh and there's a lot of things that are happening in front of you that you, you have to solve certain problems. You, you have to do some editing and you have to do some, uh, some color exercises and, and bring in all your experience uh, into one moment. And I think for me, it's a, not a, a very spiritual person, but I consider it a sort of state of Zen of not, just being focused on one thing for a fixed amount of time. Um, I think somebody who jumped in earlier, one of the attendees, Sarah Becker, said something like, I'm just a longtime student. And that that's exactly the frame of mind, is to be a, a perpetual, eternal student uh, on this plein air work. Um, so when I go out, I, the tendency is to go out, what's a painting that I have seen that's very successful? And what's a, a successful composition? And what is, uh, you know, something that's tried or true? And I could drive around forever looking for these things, but sometimes I, I find it better to look for some problem that I haven't quite got a handle on. When I do that, I find that my my mind is more alert and I'm not sort of asleep at the wheel when I start painting this thing that I know I can pull off quite easily. Uh, when I'm looking at a problem, it it is stressful and uh, but so satisfying at the same time. This is my friend, Neil Hughes. He's uh, not actually looking at the boat that's in front of him. He's looking at a boat that's behind me, actually, and he's just turning to his canvas because it's against the sun and and uh, and that's what he's doing there but I I really I enjoyed this scene of Neil with his uh, orange tote of all the gear that he carries and uh, and this old uh, Chesapeake by boat that's being uh, restored and uh, yeah I could I could talk about that or you want to pull up some others or Okay. Uh, this I'm glad you you showed this one. This is an egg temporal. It's something I, I took up during COVID. Uh, and I don't know how applicable it is to plein air work because it's best egg tempers are, are worked over time because of the film that the egg uh, gives it. It doesn't uh, allow you to layer as well as you could with oil. But it, it does have, because it's a water-based thing, I really... I really like the way it behaves in a in certain ways. There's a certain amount of energy at this early stage, and uh, and it's kind of like my uh, uh, it just, just I'm, I'm fascinated with the temper medium. It's very different from the watercolor that I I like to work in because of the uh, the edges don't shape themselves. I have to shape them uh, just like you would in an oil painting. Does that go to your being on point and enjoying like almost that edge of, is it stressful or uh, like meeting the challenge? Does that medium provide that for you? Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Again? <laughs> well, you were describing before how like when you choose a scene, you pick something that's like at the edge, of, like you don't want to just phone it in and be like, yep, there I am. I'm yeah. going to do a ship again. Like you pick something purposefully to, to keep your skills sharp and to make you alert. So does switching to egg tempera and you've been doing oil lately. So does the switching up of medium provide that same kind of stimulus for you? Oh, maybe to some extent, uh, you know, just getting out of your comfort zone. Um, but there, there is really, you know, no substitute for being, uh, on the site and looking at stuff. I could take a photograph of this and it would be a completely different energy uh, that I'd, I'd work with. Plus, one of the things is a nuisance about plein air work, though, and uh, not to be discounted, is uh, interruptions from people that are coming around you. And, and uh, I was in a bar painting that scene and I had somebody wanted to show me all their paintings that they had on their iPhone. And there was just no way person had been drinking a bit 
And I couldn't get out of that situation without being a little bit rude. And th that didn't go down very well. But again, I, th I think every time I look at this painting, I think about that uh, rude instant. So <laughs> th that's something you wouldn't get in the studio, you know. So it's a, um, it's, it's a, uh, there's a Charles Reed, a wonderful watercolor painter who passed away a few years ago. He always looked at these things as happenings, uh, sort of 60s hippie term. This just is a, a moment, a theater in life happening in public view. And it's um, it's what I really love about it. It's not like I have a goal to turn out a great painting or anything like that. It is just I'm acting out and and uh, validating life and light and color and and all of that so uh, i love that approach to to plein air work i i remember being so attracted to your work i remember that time i met you i i was just like i was so excited i maybe was going to get to talk to stuart white <laughs> and see you paint so i you work either very methodically on drawing, even though your work looks very spontaneous, you were saying in your notes that you presented that plan error like compresses your time and kind of spurs you onward to like that edge of, you use the term sloppiness, but yet this just looks infused with life and that term happening, that's, that's a wonderful term. Oh, thank you. That's so. Uh, that's exactly what that's, uh, this is about is, that the paper is the uh, the driving uh, color, or if you will, of of the painting. There's it's what I didn't paint that is the thing that uh, that uh, is the strength here, and that's what I I like how light goes through the pigment, and then bounces back, and that's how you get light and shadows and, <clears throat> and and light on top of things, which I find you know difficult to do in opaque medium. But um, that's that's kind of what what this was, and I'm glad you brought up drawing. I think it's when I teach a class, uh, it is a bit of a, a hindrance when there's not a lot of drawing uh, ability. You can't just go out after a painting without having spent a lot of time uh, in in drawing and observational drawing at that. So, uh, and you have a. Um you're well-trained in architectural drawings. And in fact, you have accepted jobs to create architectural drawings. If, are you still active with that as well? Yeah, to some extent. I I did architectural illustration as a way to make a living drawing and painting. And, uh, and it was a, a useful skill in its day. Computers taken over a lot. But I, uh, I do envy a lot of young people that are going right into painting and are able to do this plein air work and make a living at that. That wasn't around when I was coming up. <coughs> so, uh, yeah. but I guess, you know. That's a really good point, Stuart. It's, it's a, it could be a career path now if, if somebody chooses and is dedicated to that. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful work and artists are uh, coming up and I love to see it, but I am jealous as well. So, um, and this is again uh, using a lot of the white of the paper to to drive the the theme, which was basically a, a nearby farm that has a, a beautiful variety of chickens, and um, and so this this is kind of the uh, uh, you know playing on these compositions of of making your eye move in a certain predictable way, and you position things in a certain way. Here you're doing a moving target. I'm, at least Neil was in position and you knew he was going to repeat his moves. Tell us, Stuart, about achieving these darks. What does this represent? Do you have an adage in watercolor? Like I shouldn't add more than two layers. Do you try to get the darks? So I'm noticing you have the full spectrum here. And when I used to create watercolor, when I was doing plein air, that was an issue that I had is, is achieving those rich darks in watercolor and also, the, you mentioned the white before. Let's talk about these darks and how that might transition into taking it indoors and being like, oh, did I get the value right? Right. You, you can't have light without shadow. And uh, and I do think that uh, over diluting your paint is a, is a weakness in a watercolor. 
because you're dipping your brush into a water, you're taking into the pigment, you're rinsing out your brush, and you're kind of thinning out things. And there's a lot of things that keep adding water to your paper. And uh, and that end result is it's it's a little washed out. So uh, to you know work with a loaded brush and try to get it on there as uh, as as heavy as you can without layering a lot because uh, what you're looking at basically is is white paper with minerals scattered on top of it mixed with water and gum and what uh, you really want to get is there's light going through that mineral getting hitting the white of the paper and then bouncing back into your eye and that gives the painting life uh, if you over paint and and layer that stuff the light can't get through the pigment and therefore you have like dead dead color in your in your paintings so would you ever consider using gouache for the birds or was that paramount when you were creating this picture and all the other ones just sing with light um it seems like you're really in love with the transparency of those translucent washes and saving the white of the paper does gouache play less of a role for you there's if you put gouache down next to white of the paper there's no comparison they they don't substitute for each other i can use little bits of white in small areas just to clean up an edge or something like that but in uh, in most cases i see some in the sky yeah, yeah. Those, those sort of things add a little sparkle this is when you're painting you can't just hold back on everything and i don't like to use frisket uh, frisket is a uh, a liquid latex that you can put on something and rub it off after you've painted over it and it will reveal the white of the paper again. But but they're they're really the white of the paper is your best and highest uh keyed up color there. Uh, same thing with this is you're you used to think that if you had really, really dark shadows, it would indicate you had a really bright day. And, and it, it isn't truth. It's uh it seems like if your shadows are a little bit lighter, you can really start to create much more light that their light bounces off the earth and, and into shadows. And uh, this is at the Naval Academy nearby. And basically uh, it's an exercise in, in geometric solid forms, the, the sphere, the cube, and that's, that's about it. So it's, uh, you know, this is how most of all life is made up of those, those th three or four basic forms. I love the richness of your washes. It looks like only about 2% of the paper is really left because you have this very transparent wash here. Would you say that's about accurate? Yeah, I think that's so. just one of the the uh, the beauties of glazing that way. And sometimes uh, you can just weigh something down with a couple of little, you know, thin, thin washes. And- Stuart, uh, oh, what's sorry, go ahead. I was just just putting some of these things that are kind of to to uh, you know connect these structures to the earth, and uh, I studied a lot of British watercolor painters in the nineteenth century, architectural illustrators, and they it, they they seem to all paint in watercolor as uh, as a part of their discipline in in design. Uh, it's a very effective medium for that. That's true. This is a scene I might pass by. I love what you did with it. Tell, tell us about that moment of inspiration. What made you choose to paint this? Uh, I, I just like the strength of the forms. Um, and I enjoyed, uh, I mean, I just, I thought the, the dome, I think this was before they started recladding it with copper and that just that big sphere the way it catches light, I think it always uh, is uh, compelling and attractive to to civilization. I think that the greatest domes that we've seen are like, they're just like your eye goes up to them. They're just, uh, it's a powerful, powerful architectural form. I mean, if you've been to Paris, uh, Christine, and you know how many of uh, those buildings put a little dome on the corner or do something and it just catches the light and it's uh, it's inspiring. It is very much so. I think, oh, we got one more. And uh, then we're going to be looking at Nancy's work next. 
Um, anything else to add to this? Uh, but your use of form, again, is, is wonderful. You know, I'm glad you chose this one to, to end up on because this is, uh, to me, again, uh, why I use watercolor in plein air is uh, because there's a certain immediacy to things. It's, it's not, uh, you know, I haven't ruled things out. I haven't really gotten these nice square windows and everything else. But the gesture of this uh, I mean, house painter's shadow had had such a nice little flow and an energy to it and how I kind of like colors to sort of bleed into the other and you have sort of lost and found edges uh, kind of coming into it and it becomes no longer a, to me a narrative about an action of a painter on a building but it becomes an abstraction of the interaction of light and shadow and and that to me has suddenly you know fires my imagination uh, to uh, you know either create a, a scene or a narrative but beyond it's just sort of the delight of color and form well thanks so much for sharing your work with us and uh people if you have if you're on and you have questions a, a few have a few questions have come up but what we're going to do again um if you have just joined us is look at the artist's work and then we'll we'll be able to have more of a discussion between the artists and people will be able to ask questions so thanks Perfect. so much Stuart. next up we have nancy and here we get a good look at a uh, plein air setup um nancy would you like to join us and talk about um some of your plein air paintings that you've decided to share with us today Sure. Excellent. Me too. Is this your favorite setup, by the way? This is a. Uh, um... Well, you know, it it used to be, but unfortunately, that easel got run over at a plein air event, so I don't have that box anymore. Um, lately, I've been using uh, both the Gloucester easel, like uh, Jill had, and a uh, uh, Easy L, which is a nice box too. Um, I, I have actually several different setups. I actually have a car setup where I can uh, set an a easel on my steering wheel and uh, paint inside my car. Uh, oh, I like, saw that on Instagram. Yeah, lately that's my favorite. <laughs> and here you are in the studio. Um, I, I do, do everything from small work to big work. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I work all sizes. Yeah, this was a... Uh, a studio painting that um, I did for the Waterfowl Festival. Um, and it's interesting because if I had attempted that before I spent 20 years plein air painting, I never would have been able to do it. But there is a lot of memory and knowledge of how things really look outside, um, imagination, uh, that comes from my years of plein air painting. And um, I, I every day realize that if I had only painted in the studio, I would be really handicapped. Um, so plein air has just become a big part of my growth. Although I, I do love to paint in the studio um, as much as I like. Do you ever go seeking something plein air? I know you live in the Easton area. So therefore, let's say you were working on this painting and you thought, I need to see into the shadow of what's happening on the wharf. Would you go seeking information plein air? Or do you feel like, um, that, like what happens when you get a stuck point on a larger piece like this? It's funny you say that because I'm working on a piece right now. Uh, it's a commissioned piece and it's supposed to happen at dawn. And I just don't feel like I have the, the right colors and the right values um, from the photo reference I'm using. So I think I'm going to have to uh, bite the bullet and get out there <laughs> and you know experience it uh, before I, I feel totally happy with this commission. Well, you got your car uh, you well now, Nancy. You're all set. I do. I may just sleep out there and then set an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, this this is this is uh, one I did in Plenary Easton. Uh, it's a little different than 
most of my plein air work. Um, I, I really think plein air should be mostly observational because I, it's a time to get out and really look and um, understand what light's doing and shadows are doing. And uh, it's not an attempt to, uh, to make a, a great painting or even a memorable painting. It's, it's really um, experience. But this particular one was a, a larger painting. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Plenary Easton and a few of the other events, um, they love big paintings in that event and um, big paintings get seem to get more attention. So I have tried to, to paint larger and to try some um, techniques that are a little different. So, um, this one, I was really going for the collection of shapes. And I think the painting was a 24 by 24. And uh, to speed the process up, because I, if I try to paint a, a painting that size in one setting all in oil, it turns out to be a great big mess. So this was one where I blocked in the, um, the shapes in uh, acrylic. And you can see some of the blue uh, showing through at the edges, and that's that's the acrylic. And uh, after I'd done that, I, I let it dry. And then I went in with the oil um, using a lot of palette knife and scrapers and things like that. So um, it was a uh, it was an experiment. Um, I ended up not submitting it into the competition because I felt like it it was, you know, it didn't look like the rest of my work, but it sold right away. And uh, since then, I have done that more and more, trying to speed up the process and uh, paint larger. But at, in, in my heart, I really believe plein air paintings are best when they're quick, short expressions of um, light, and uh, atmosphere and the feeling you had when you were in front of that scene. That feeling is so important. I agree. Nancy, yeah. you touched on something that I think is really important. And uh, we should mention to viewers that you have the important role of being the judge for Plein Air Easton this year. Last year, you were the ju judge for admission. And this year, you will be um, judging the awards. Can you talk to us a bit? about uh, Easton is a very prestigious competition. And in fact, you were the one of the founders for that. And um, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on a body of work. And you mentioned that you had selected this piece, I'm assuming for, um, we, we have what's called the back 40 or it's reserve paintings. And then you get to select two competition pieces for consideration for the judge. So would you, what were your considerations and why did you, th this didn't play nice with your other selection piece? Describe those thoughts that you had. Yeah, that's exactly it. You, you know, when you're ready to, and I think that's the hardest thing about Easton is it limits you to two competition pieces. Some of the other competitions will let you hang everything up. Um, but Easton is specific that you only have two pieces to be judged for, uh, awards. And so it's really always a tense time at the end of the week trying to decide which ones of your paintings to put in. And I generally put them all out and look at them. And then I try to figure out what's going to hang together and look good together. And um, I don't know if other artists do that, but I, I feel like um, it's important that there's a consistency to your best work. So you're not looking for variety, you're looking for consistency a bit more. Yeah, I mean, variety and subject matter, but um, I, I more consistency in, uh, in medium and how you handle it um, overall. And so I felt like this was a little bit of an outlier, so I didn't. Now, this may, my work may move more and more toward this, and um, we'll see. That's another thing. I... I I don't want to um, settle on one look, one style, and paint it the rest of my life. Like Stuart said, I feel like I'm always a student. I'm always looking for uh, another way to say something. 
And um, that's what this piece was about. So um, now this is a pure plein air piece. It's a small piece that was done um, at the American Impressionist Society uh, paint out in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And um, I kind of like Jill's small piece. You can see the immediacy of the, um, the stroke and the paint application. And I was just trying to get the feel of that structure and the mountains and the clouds, which were constantly changing. changing. And uh, so it's, it's just a, uh, a much quicker, uh, less considered, I think, um, more reactive painting than the other one. It's only like a uh, eight by, I don't think it's even that big, more like a six by 12, maybe an eight by six, eight by 16. I don't know, but yeah, that was fun to paint. I, I, I really enjoy these smaller pieces. Beautiful texture in that. Thank you. Oh, this is, um, this is a studio painting. And this is a really big one that I did um, this year for um, the Waterfowl Festival. It's called The Gathering. And um, again, this is not one that I could have painted. I had maybe five or six different reference pieces. Um, the cloud is pretty much from memory, from painting outside and um, the boats, I had probably five or six different uh, images I was pulling from. And then the water was more memory because um, I was trying to introduce movement into the painting, um, following that kind of big sweep there and with the big sweep through the clouds. But again, um, this is not something I could have done without the years of uh, plein air painting. When you do a large studio painting like this, I, you mentioned working through the process and always going back to the plein air, but what was, did you see this? And so you're trying to match what's in your memory. Did you start with maybe- I, didn't, I did not see, I've seen a lot of boats out there. Uh, these are tongers, hand tongers. That's what those um, vertical lines are. I've seen lots of them out there together. I've never seen them in this particular configuration. Uh, this is one I just designed um, in the studio uh, based on what, what I had seen. Um, so yeah, this just, I, I actually worked out, I've started to do it more and more lately. I've been, I worked it out as a small piece, a very quick, uh, it was about 11 by 14. I actually did this, the dem the uh, small piece is a demo at a show I had in Norfolk and uh, talked about how I take different shapes and different photos and even a plein air painting and put them all together to create the big painting. Uh, oh, that's great. Uh, I think that's really interesting as a process on like what spark creates a big painting. So thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Oh, then. Uh, Nancy, is there anything else uh, you'd like to say about working plein air or your time doing plein air? Um, not, well, yes, I'd like to invite everybody to the Academy <laughs> Art Museum uh, this July because I am having a show as the judge um, and it will be uh, selections of pieces that I've done from a bunch of different plein air events that are all somehow related to plein air easton so it'll be a uh interesting show because it's, it's like 15 or 16 years of um paintings that i've done at different competitions and they certainly didn't all sell and they weren't all winners but i do think that it will be interesting um to see for for the viewer uh what and you'll be you'll be the quick draw judge so oh um, yeah don't remind me of that <laughs> it's scary enough to do the awards but it's pretty <laughs> yeah i kind of blocked I, that I out think, of my memory <laughs> well what uh, what we're talking about here is i i think also in joking about the judging and so forth 
Um, somebody's got to do it. And yeah. you have been a great plein air painter for so long. And we do all respect each other. But uh, Stuart was talking about new people coming in. And um, there, there's a lot of people to respect in the plein air world. So we'll just see. I, do, I, I would like to say that um, I'd like to encourage everybody that is, you know, sticking their toe into the into plein air painting to not be afraid to enter uh, plein, air comp plein air events. Uh, Easton was really set up as a way for new people to get in. Um, we only invite five people back, I think, and everybody else is uh, is judged by a different judge every year. So it's not an invitational. It is purely uh, a jury competition. And every year, uh, people that have never been in plein air competitions get into plein air Easton even though it's kind of known as one of the, the biggest around, um, there is still opportunity for, you know, a new rising star to, to make their mark. And um, I think Jill's a good example of that. Um, and That was my second event ever. Um, and Christine, people, yeah. people were either jealous I was in or really sorry for me or like <laughs> shocked that I got in. Like I, I saw, wait, Wait, you got into Easton? I was like, yes. Yeah, yeah that's that. <laughs> that's the thing. There, it, everybody's got an equal chance every year, and yeah. previous award winners have not gotten in some years. So, um, you know, it's fresh slate every year, and uh, encourage you to, if you don't enter, come out and check it out. Uh, and the quick draw is open to everybody. We should stress that, Nancy. That's correct. The quick, um, the quick draw is what would you say 80 percent of the work sells of, of the quick draw painting it's, yeah it's a, a buying frenzy and uh the good thing about the quick draw is um i think if you win the quick draw you get invited back you do uh, uh, so for those who are new to a quick draw that's you have two hours to create two hours thing. it it is the purest plein air painting there is yeah yeah true two hours Okay. Well, thanks so much, Nancy. Um, well, there'll be more later from everybody. I'll just go through a few things. This is me. I've done plein air painting for a while now. I challenged my, I liked what Stuart was saying that um, he likes to push that edge. And I think we're all talking about how plein air surprises us. So I went to Texas after years of saying, I don't want to paint there. There's nothing to paint for me. Then one year I thought, well, that would be the whole point is to extract some drama and, and find, go to Texas, find something good there. So that's how I chose that plein air event is to kind of find that edge. And, and somebody did say, usually there's some water in Texas, Christine, you might have to go look for it, but you could find it. So here I am painting, um, and instead of water, I got really attracted to these rocks. So as we're all saying, you never know what you're going to find. And my strategy is that sometimes I'll go into an event thinking I might want to go look for something, but here, instead of going to look for the water, I got stopped in my tracks with these rocks. And I just thought I have got to paint that. And so that's kind of the hook for me to get excited about an image. This in fact, was a scene that I did find in Texas and they have a beautiful water lily collection. So never presume, always be kind of open-minded to the possibilities that are there. I really wouldn't have been able to create this from a photo. This is the literal scene that I saw. And there's something that kind of takes over my brain when I'm thinking about, uh, you know, how do I deal with this jumble? I I, I love the scatter pattern. I used to be a watercolorist for many years before I switched to oil. And I, I still do watercolor sometimes, but not for competition. So this is an oil painting, even though you can see some watercolor aspects to this. Uh, there's something about being in plein air that it helps me sort out stuff because it's three-dimensional space instead of a flatness. I mean, if I gridded this out, even if I spent a lot of time, found the perfect light, 
arranged the perfect shapes, corrected things in Photoshop, adjusted for the color, even used multiple references, I still wouldn't have come up with this painting as is because this represents me standing at the edge of the water and trying to infuse some joy into that scene. And it, it just, I feel myself kind of shift and something does take over. I was not always like that, but uh, these days I know that odds are that might be my competition painting. We, we talked about a body of work created during the week. And in fact, this was a competition painting of mine. Um, and, and that's how I've learned to kind of listen to that intuition um, when I create a painting. Also for viewers, I wanted to talk about a, a, any type of scene can be exciting. This was created in Bath County. They did a plein air event for many years. Sometimes a plein air event runs for five, 10 years, usually after about 10 years, either uh, the new events will be starting up. Uh, if people are wondering like which ones to choose, is it better to choose an old one? Is it better to choose a new one? I would just go where either you feel the urge to challenge yourself to paint. Some people choose to drive a short distance. So uh, also there's prizes. How much money could you make if you did win a prize? These could all be factors. So I chose to go to uh, Virginia because I thought rolling hills, that would be fun. I was unprepared for the fog each morning. And I thought, this is amazing. And the fog only lasted for about 10 minutes at times after I set up. So my strategy was to create these color notes. And you can see from the photo that there's, there's no, okay, I have veils of atmosphere going in the distance, but I wouldn't have known that the sky was yellow. I wouldn't have known that there was a peach color in the background. I wouldn't have been able to capture the iridescence and I would have gotten bogged down with the shapes. And the fog helped to clarify some of the shapes. So my strategy was to get my notes going in the distance, foreground, middle ground, and background. And from there, I thought, well, I can always tinker with shapes. And then happily some sheep showed up. So that was great. But you could see here at this point, the fog has totally left the scene, but I had locked in my, my color chips. And therefore that was my strategy for creating just this really fleeting light condition. And of course, in a plein air event, we are not, I, I took a photo because I thought it was an interesting condition to share with students later on, perhaps, or just for my own records. Or like Nancy said, working up a study into something bigger. This is a 12 by 12 painting. And it I was part of my competition body of work. I, I felt that this was a successful painting, especially for plein air, showcasing the typical morning that would happen there, even though it was fleeting light. And it's uh, it's a favorite painting of mine that I haven't really showcased before. Uh, here's a series of progression shots. You can see over here is the literal photo of the scene. And I start with a really washy background. Again, color notes, because the light and the color might change. They can always manipulate shape. And you can see this rock was in sun. Here, the shadow is, all, uh, the shadow is always shifting. And um, I, we go through the progression, you can see the, then the rock goes in shadow here. And I, I worked as long as I could on this painting. And, uh, I, I did want to give a shout out to, um, Nancy walked by as I was framing it. And we're, even though we can't work from photos at a plein air event, we can touch edges or manipulate a few things. And I had decided when I put it in the frame that the linear element that I had thought I had wanted to feature, I, I was unsure of that at the time. I, I got as far as I could. You could you could see there's a little bit of ragged edge up here. And I thought, well, I'll just finish that eggplant color up here when I frame it. 
But what ended up happening was I had to actually create a little bit of foliage and Nancy walked by and she's like, wow, that, that has a fresh feeling. Don't kill it, Christine. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I did want to mention that that's typical of the plein air world that um, people are very friendly. It, it's not a, I, I've actually had somebody when I created that Lily painting, I think that's all I've got for, so I'll stop share here. So when I created that lily painting, a friend of mine was like, Christine, you should go to Texas. They have amazing water lilies there. And I was like, wait, what? Uh, but my friend thought of me. Uh, she knew that was a subject that I liked. And there is that spirit in the plein air world. It's, it's a competition, yes. And we hope we sell. We hope we get an award. But I've seen friends give, give each other frames, uh, help out it's a very welcoming community and i just can't stress that enough for anybody who's considering it that it, it's not um it, it's not closed off like you might think like well i would never get that or i i would feel like first time i was in east and i i did have imposter syndrome by the time i showed up and then i thought you know what nobody's born painting and all of these artists i admire in this competition they had their first year doing this and they did their first competition. So just get busy, show up and do the job. So uh, I thought if we have some time, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think the time is pretty good. I thought we would talk a little bit about uh, some other elements of, of plein air and maybe we'll circle back to Jill and maybe tell us about some of your first plein air events. We'll, we'll start out like talking about like what that experience is for each of us just briefly. And then I have some other things to go through. Maybe when Jill is talking and, and we go through that order, also think about some funny anecdotes you'd like to share for our next round discussion. How does that sound? So Jill, you wanna go ahead and tell us how things got started for you? Sure. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. So I, I started late. Um, I, I, it's painting is really my second career. Uh, I was uh, in city planning prior to having a family and raising, raising four kids. And so in 2009, I, I signed up for an oil painting class. Um, and that was really my first time uh, painting. So um, I, I realized that that was gonna be, that truly is my passion and I needed to explore it more, especially landscapes. Uh, that was, that was uh, pulling, pulling my heart, heart strings. So, um, my, so my first event um, was in 2011 at Mountain, Maryland. Um, so it was a couple, a couple years after, and I remember walking, I was, I was so nervous, so nervous. And, uh, I remember walking around and looking at the other artists and thinking, there is no way I belong here. <laughs> I don't know what, what the heck am I doing here? Uh, I think, uh, one of the artists I, I passed by was, um, was Hulai, uh, who I don't know, probably she's in this area as well, or our region. But she is a phenomenal artist and she, I had gotten up early in the morning, I thought, uh, to go paint. And meanwhile, I'm walking around and see Hulai, who's already full into this absolutely fabulous painting. Um, and I, I felt a little bit uh, out of my element. <laughs> so, oh my goodness, maybe I should just go home. So that whole imposter syndrome what am I doing here type of thing came into play. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, but then I went and, and found a beautiful scene that, that, uh, resonated with me and I felt pleased with what I had done. And, um, it, you know, looking back, it probably wasn't that great, <laughs> but, but, um, but I was inspired. And I think that that's half the battle really is to find a spot that, uh, really resonates with you. Um, and makes your heart go pitter patter and decide that you're going to, you're going to tackle it and, um, and go ahead and, and don't, uh, you know, not that there's no fear. Certainly I was scared 
very, very, very scared about the whole thing, but I decided I was going to do it anyway. And, um, and uh, anyway, it was, it was a good experience overall. Then in 2012, I decided to um, apply to Easton, which, um, which was ridiculous, honestly. Uh, uh, but because I live in near, near Easton, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll, I'll see. It would certainly be convenient to paint what I love to paint and paint this area. And I ended up getting in, which was um, also overwhelming, and but super exciting. And um, Christine, I totally forget your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you answered it, actually. Okay. I, <laughs> I was thinking that um, it, it's, as you were describing, like your point of inspiration and all of that, um, one time we painted together and you said, I need to go find a quiet um, spot to paint. Uh, let's, let's, you know, get together later for dinner or something. But I thought that was really interesting in watching you paint that you knew what you needed. Uh, you knew like the space and the, the type of scene that you needed, and you were also trusting your intuition. So that has stayed true throughout your career. And now you're working. I also remember having a discussion with you. I'm like, I haven't seen you at events in a while. And, and you said something very wise, I thought, which was I only select a few that I want to participate in and that you're busy with galleries and designers wanting your work and you chose to spend a little bit more time with your family. So I feel like you have a good grasp on how to balance that time. Um, but did you want to offer anything to say about that? Like as you progress, like checking in with yourself? Yeah, I think um, I think that that actually is very important. Um, I think that uh, what is it the the tail wagging the dog versus you know I I think uh, we have to be careful in our field, uh, and I'm sure you all can relate to this. Is sometimes uh, things can be overwhelming, and you have to sort of step back and say, okay, what's best for me? You know, what's best for Christine or Nancy may not be, or Stuart might not be what's best for me, and um, so it's reevaluating those things. I certainly admire the artists that go from event to event uh, for for um, what the what they you know what's called the circuit. Um, and uh, but that's not me. I mean that I I uh, I I'll pick. I don't pick. Sometimes I, it's they pick me. Uh, but if I do get picked, I might do maybe four events a year, and that's plenty for me. I don't feel that. You know, I don't feel it's necessary to, for me to do more than that. And I, I love studio painting too. I love to, to um, take the ideas that I get from being out outdoors and then uh, work on studio pieces, sort of like what Nancy was saying. So it's, it's, um, it's a balancing act, I think, for sure. Well, thanks, Jill. Uh, let's check in with Stuart. Stuart, how did you get started? And where do you think you are now as far as like, has that changed for you? Uh, well, I got started by going out and having a, a sketchbook of people sitting out on a on the sidewalk under a cafe, you know, umbrellas and things like that, because I needed them to put into what they call the entourage of a rendering of a building to give it to give it life. And I, one point, I believe I was in Annapolis and I stumbled on. Uh, uh, some artists that were painting I thought this is wonderful and uh, and asked them what they were doing that they were in in the middle of a competition and I was ready to you know, just jump in there too and they said no no there's a process you have to get accepted you have to apply and you have to you know go online and and look them up these things and and I was like online what does that mean <laughs> <laughs> But uh, and then I, I I found out about it. Uh, I think I did a, a Annapolis, and then uh, there were quite a few around it, and I got in, and, and I uh, I love it. And I think that that my architectural uh, renderings were a big help to uh, to doing that. But it was it was addictive. I I wanted to do them all. I didn't have the time. I had to take off vacation time to go on events and. Uh, and I kind of like agree with Jill as you can't do them all. There are too many. And you, you, I've reached a burnout phase on that. And um, I think I'll still, you know, try to apply to the ones I really like. 
Um, but I, I live in Easton now and I, I go out and paint when I can and paint with other people. And there's some active local groups that gather. And I think that's great that, that communities have that. And, uh, yeah, it's it, it's a terrific life that being introduced to this plein air world uh, that are in that I'm in. Uh, I, I have a question. I, I was like, Christine, you do workshops abroad, and I'm doing a few. And I'm I get the question: Why go abroad to to do plein air? Can't you just work in your backyard? What do you think are some of the advantages to that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it it speaks to uh paint what makes your heart go pitter patter and for me that's Paris <laughs> so wow. I was kind of always looking for ways to go back there and I thought yeah that would also be a big challenge um conversely Stuart I love the idea of painting your backyard I've, I've painted a lot of backyard scenes not the beach <laughs> but um I think it's finding that point of excitement. Nancy mentioned that well, in addition, when she was talking about preparing for the waterfowl fowl festival, the images, she, she had this kind of desire to try something. And I, I think it stems from that. I desire to try something like perhaps maybe I want to paint. I did a Bahamas workshop once and I thought, yeah, those aqua waters and foliage like Sargent did those palmettos I want to do that that would be so great so the challenge and stimulation of just something completely new that that does speak to me yeah. um I think I already talked about myself as to my point of inspiration and how I got started uh, did that answer your question Stuart did you want to hear from other folks as well yeah, I, because it's um, I I like going there for the same reason the, the pitter patter and it, it excites me to travel, but I, I also sometimes think people go on a painting holiday to just be in a different environment and to be uh, you know willingly in in an unfamiliar situation like language and. Uh, uh, I mean, I just, I'm a big fan of the painting holiday idea and going someplace, uh, another part of the world to paint if you can do it. And uh, I just, I'm just really looking for more selling points on why should somebody sign up for a trip across the the big pond, you know, to paint. Uh, it might be for for camaraderie and friendship and it's a, it's a different way to see, see the world with your sketchbook. But yeah, well, you I know. The other thing, Stuart, is Europe is fairly compact. You could be in a different city in a really short amount of time. Sometimes with America, like the logistics of going somewhere, I mean, to go to Telluride, for example, is eight hours of travel, or I could go to Paris. It's really the same amount of time. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's check in with Nancy, see how she got started. And then uh, possibly open it up to more questions, including some like Stuart's question. I think that's a, a great question. So if you guys have more questions. Uh, Nancy, how did you get started, Plenair? I got started um, because a friend dragged me to uh, a meeting of the Washington Society of Landscape Painters. And uh, prior to that, I had been uh, a portrait painter and a, purely a studio painter. and did the occasional landscape from photographs, but uh, I think my only experience in painting outside was one time in college where that was required to graduate from painting 101. <laughs> but um, I, so I started doing that and I, I enjoyed it. And then the big thing, and I tell you, this was a, a seminal event because um, I think a lot of things came out of this trip. A friend of mine uh, had been juried into Carmel Plein Air. They've been doing Plein Air events out in California for many years. And she asked me to go with her just to paint with her and keep her company. So I went and so I saw my first Plein Air event and competition and it was so exciting. And I'll never forget uh, the quick draw seeing uh, 
Joe Huang and another uh, Timothy Moore and paint each other's portraits, you know, in two hours. And I thought, this is this is just great, you know. And then the uh, the auction and just the excitement around so many artists, you know, painting and so many people being excited about it. So when I came back home, we had just moved to Easton and uh, long story short, I presented the idea to Easton and um, they went for it and it, it took off. But I think, wow, if I never made that trip to Carmel, <laughs> I'm sure it would have happened, but it would have happened at a different time in a different way. It was also the same year that uh, Eric Rhodes was starting Plein Air Magazine. So it seemed like all the the world wanted it to happen, you know, the universe wanted it to happen and, and everything was lining up nicely. And uh, so that's, uh, so for three years, I was strictly a volunteer and organizer for Plein Air Easton. And then after three years, it was kind of like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> I've got to mm -hmm. get back to painting. And so then I started entering and, and my first competition actually was a uh, Wayne Plein Air, which is a really, uh, good competition has been going along on as long as we have i think uh, mm -hmm. in pennsylvania so yeah nancy you bring up a great point which is the grassroots uh, excitement that, of the public the public can get involved with uh, plein air uh, either collecting work they can meet the artists they see work getting created and in this day and age uh, especially um, I, I think it's extremely relevant. And I, I, for the first time, saw actual stampedes of people wanting to collect art. So was that happening for you in Carmel? Was that also kind of intoxicating? Like, holy cow, look at all of these collectors. Yeah, that's what was happening. And yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing, really. Um, the enthusiasm, because prior to that, I've been used to the gallery scene and, uh, I love galleries, but galleries have a hard time generating that type of enthusiasm. I think it's the here today, gone tomorrow aspect of a plein air event um, that uh, gets people so excited. But, and uh, kids can participate. I've seen families yeah. um, letting kids pick out a painting. It's really quite wonderful. Yeah, that, that is. Yeah, I've seen it over and over again that uh, serious collectors come, bring their children and start them collecting. And I've also seen people um, that would never ever dream of uh, owning an original piece of art um, start their collecting journey at events like the Quick Draw, where you can sometimes buy a painting for fifty dollars, and um, it 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 answers a hunger or something or a need. And so a lot of people do become collectors uh, thanks to these events and uh, will go on to collect, you know, at different events and also from, uh, you know, their price point will go up as they, they uh, are able to afford more. Yeah. I think it's, I'm, I'm glad I remembered to bring up the collectors because that's, part of the art world, we can't have a job and we can't make a living and we can't do any of this, nor would the events exist if there wasn't robust collecting going on. With that said, for anybody who's like, wow, I'm signing up tomorrow for every event that I can, you have to know that usually there's an outlay of cash to participate in the form of there is a fee to be juried in. You're not guaranteed lodging. The best events do have lodging included with a host home. So these are just some logistics about the events themselves. And there is a prize purse, but you could win a prize, but not sell a painting. Uh, so there's kind of a balance of the competition, how many artists are entering, what is the prize purse, what type of package are they giving you, such as lodging or... Are they going to, nobody offers a stipend and therefore you have to pay. I saw in the chat, you know, what about supplies uh, that, oh yeah, I forgot to plug in my computer. Uh, I'm going to go to sleep soon. I have to move my computer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was in the middle of something good to say too. Uh, anyway, maybe Nancy, you could finish talking about that while I go move my computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, no, they, they don't 
give a stipend, but most events are really generous and um, you'll get to stay in some interesting places. I've stayed on ranches in Texas and um, the host families generally uh, treat you to some meals and uh, it's always nice to, to treat them you know, before you leave. But um, it's a wonderful way to get to know people um, that you wouldn't ordinarily have a chance to know, both artists and uh, collectors. Um, so you may you may end up only making you know breaking even. Um, you may end up uh, in in the red, but you at least have um, some work that you can bring back and maybe tweak a little bit and sell it elsewhere. Um, uh, you never know. You never know what what's going to come of um, your adventure, and uh, I I think it's it's money well spent. And um, if you are serious about having an art career and want to uh, to get noticed, um, that's how you build your collector base. Being and plus the uh, the wonderful aspect of really being inspired by your um, contemporary uh, fellow artists. I, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to bring my A game. So-and-so is going to be there. That's, 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 that, that's a good thing and a bad thing. And I, I have to share that because uh, I had a fairly robust career before I started plein air. I was doing a lot, I was in galleries and I was doing, you know, a significant number of commissions and then when I started plein air, I was like, oh my God, I love the way he does that. I love the way she does that. And oh, I got to use that panel. Oh, I need that brand of oil paint. And I was absorbing so much from so many good artists that I kind of was losing myself. Um, took my daughter to say, mom, <laughs> you've got to get back to who you are. And so I think you have to, you have to paint the way you paint doesn't mean you don't take some advice from somebody or you may learn one little thing from somebody, but I think it's really important to continue to develop who you are as a painter and paint the things you like to paint and, um, you know, put some blinders on when you go in, oh, the worst moment in a plein air competition is the moment we all turn in where we've been feeling pretty good about our work. And then we walk in and we get a glimpse of that work. We get a glimpse of that work. And immediately we start feeling like, ah, oh, I suck. <laughs> yeah, the roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a roller coaster. But I think you just have to keep painting, painting, painting. Um, lots of bad paintings. So you can have those few masterpieces. And yeah. Uh, Every painting does not deserve a frame. That's what I tell my students. <laughs> Do not start framing this before you finished it because it may not be worthy. Sometimes the judgment is off. Like I, I might not exhibit it, but I've learned not to scrape down in the fields because sometimes I get home later and I'm like, oh, actually, like now I can finally see this piece. Like I lose all objectivity. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah exactly. It does yeah. take some distance. Well, let's check in with Jordan briefly. How are we doing on time? Is it okay if we have a Q and A now, Jordan? Would Absolutely. You... Uh, yeah, we're way over on time, but the, again, we're flexible. Um, but yeah, if we Q and A with people. Uh, do you want to do it through chat, or do you want to just have people pipe in? Um, we could we could have people pipe in. I did want to just say that if you have a supply question, I think uh, Nancy answered that. A great source of frames is a place called JFM Frames. Um, so that they're based in Atlanta. They sell frames wholesale. So you, I think at one point you had to have an EIN number for that. Uh, but um, yes, the other thing about supplies is we all teach and have um, supplies on our website. And there you can find upcoming events. Nancy mentioned she was having a show. Um, I list my events on my website um, and uh, Stuart and Jill, if you had anything to add to that, either as to supplies, because I, I think we might get a lot of supply questions. <laughs> like, what? It's always the case. Um, so Stuart and Jill, do you have anything to add to that, either upcoming events or supplies? Um, I, I had the question about when you do travel, uh, can you get 
solvents and things like that. And, and that's a problem for oil painters. That's why I like watercolor and egg temperas because eggs and water are available everywhere around the world. But you can get with your host wherever you're going to be going and and uh, ask them what the local art supplies are and then have them ship to your destination in advance, you know, for your, your solvents and your mediums. Uh, other than that, um, no, I think the fun about plein air work is is finding out what medium works for the kind of things that you want to paint and find out, you know, um, take classes with people to get more familiar with the materials and what they work with, the you know, artists that you admire, and uh, and ask questions about all of that. You don't have to buy every color available. I think you'll do better with a simpler palette uh, in most cases. That's, that's all I have on that. Yeah. Is, there a, is there a secret, like something you personally, for all of you guys, have in your supply box that isn't normal, isn't like the standard part of a supply list that you just found you can't live without? Um, well, I paint solvent free, which is kind of like really odd for people. I, I don't know if that's a secret weapon or not, but it means I can like land fresh off the plane and just create a painting right there. And, and for me, my philosophy is um, that there, is, there are no rules regarding um, tools that I think that um, anything goes uh, in order for, in order to get what you're looking for. So for me, that can be um, an edge of something um, sharp or a rubber scraper or um, obviously a palette knife, different brushes which I'm not very good about taking care of. <laughs> um, but really, I think it, it's an endless array of, of potential tools that you can use in order to get the effect that you're looking for. And um, even, even you know, with, with a glove on, using your, your fingers to, to blend an area. So I think it's endless. I, I, I don't have any rules with that. I have a question. I, this is Mariana. I have a question about how many of you might be using either watercolor paper or oil paper to carry lighter, you know, lighter sheets, for example, and then expect to mount them onto board or uh, canvas if you want. Um, do, do you have a sense for whether that's increasing in in your in the plein air field? I I would just say that that. I think that might be, it's, I think it was a really good idea. Like if you're going to Europe, but for a plein air event, that could be really disastrous because you want to spend most of your time painting and creating. Therefore, pre-primed panels are critical and standard sizes for frames because, for example, I fly to a lot of my events. So if one of my frames is damaged, um, I would want to know I could, uh, possibly a friend of mine would have that same standard size, or I would do multiples of the same size. And a work on paper that I had to spend time mounting would not be good for me. Um, right. You have you have to mount it to present it because oil paper you don't have to prime. Uh, well, works behind glass. I found that uh, a lot of watercolor artists are spraying their work and not having work behind right. glass. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I'd defer to Stuart, who does more of the works on paper. What do you think, Stuart? Uh, well, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think for traveling, taking a lot of oil paper. Remember, you're not making masterpieces. You're not under a competition. You're making you're you're you're, you're making notes, visual notes. Uh, what I think in as far as a watercolor paper, I'm not totally in the camp of spraying watercolor paper and waxing it and mounting it on a board. Uh, I know a lot of people do it. I know that when you come back with a lot of those things, that uh, humidity and things like that might change your, the adhesive and you've got bubbles behind it. I think it's got a lot of problems. Uh, I and I just I just not sold on it yet. I, but uh, so you deal with glass uh, if you if you if you must, you know. And I and that is and that is a a, a problem. A lot of people don't want to collectors. Uh, I will buy them. Uh, 
I've had some success with that, but it's again, you got maybe use Plexi because uh, you know it, it breaks. Uh, uh, but you know, I think oil paper is a, a great thing to travel with, and I think it has different absorptions when you spray them in a competition. It may be a deterrent. I mean, maybe a a negative. You know, so I would stick with panels and um, for oil painting. Sure. Thank you. That's great. Chris, Christine? Yeah. Could you talk more? Could you elaborate on being a solvent-free painter? Do you use mediums, and how do you clean your brushes? Uh, sure. I've, I've written some blog posts on that, and uh, you can find that on my website for further elaboration. But I basically start with uh, the drawing and toning layer in water mixable oils. Nancy had mentioned doing acrylic which some people have said, well, why don't you just use that? Personally, I don't like acrylic. I find that hard to work with. And uh, I, I prefer the water mixable oils for starting. And then they dry to the light touch within about five to 10 minutes. And so therefore I can, I can create my shape and it's a huge advantage at the quick draw because with my water mixable oil, I choose a French ultramarine and transparent oxide, and I create basically a tonal painting, um, which is really uncomfortable for me. But th that gives me a choice of having like an orange underpainting or a blue underpainting or a mix, which would be neutral. So that's my strategy for the quick draw. And I actually set a timer for 45 minutes telling myself, you have to do a sketch on your board. You have to do tonal. You have to know where your light, medium, dark shapes are before you do any color. And then quite simply, it's direct painting with full paint. So I can either use water mixable or I could use traditional. And I, again, elaborate this a little bit more, even on my supply list. I'm allergic to solvent. So I've had to not just minimize what I am exposed to, but I can't be, and I've never had a group studio space because if anybody's using solvent, or even if I've shared a, in a roommate situation at Easton, <laughs> my roommate brought in a gallon of solvent and I was like, okay, I'm entering into bad roommate territory, but we have to have a talk <laughs> because like I'm going to be full body hives if, and she was very nice and we, we worked it out. Um, so, but yeah, it's become an asset. And actually I had uh, clients or excuse me, students of mine who were in my classes, like I'm just checking I'm pregnant or I have autoimmune deficiency and I need to make sure this is really solvent free, right? Like no strong odors. And I'm like, yep. And they're like, awesome. I want to learn from you. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. It's actually pretty straightforward to just do it like that. The only issue is if you've been painting with solvent for a long time, it might take a little, it, 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 you have to relearn a few things. Um, but if you're just kind of starting out in oil, I've had students that are like, what's the big fuss? This is a great way to work. Uh, there's no issue. I just did it. Hey, Christine. How do you I clean your brushes? Um, I, if it's water mixable soap and water, and then uh, otherwise I stick them in the freezer or I can use the traditional brushes, put them in the water mixable oil and then soap and water, clean them up. So you're only using water mixable oil throughout? No, I, use, I use a mixture of both. I use traditional oil because it stays wet in the box longer. It sounds complicated, but it's really not. It's, I'm just direct painting and any brush will clean up with oil. Um, so you can just, I use walnut oil. Um, so I can, I can clean my brushes with walnut oil. I mean, is it like the best? Um, I think it is, but some, there's probably 1% of my students that are like, well, I'm not allergic to gamosol and I actually like it. And I think, okay, goes back to each, each to his own. Um, but 
it's, I, you know, I don't really have a choice. So th those are my preferences. Yeah. It's definitely a healthier route. <laughs> yeah. That started when I was pregnant too. I'm like, I, <laughs> you know, she's not allergic and I don't want to do this when I'm pregnant. So yeah. Oh, Stuart, did you have a add on to that? Well, it's just going to ask if you could make a distinction between solvent and mediums. Sure. And in fact, most people don't know that many mediums contain solvent, such as cold wax. And uh, there's other mediums. Some mediums use alkyd and resin and oil. Uh, I, I'm not as well versed in mediums. I, I did when I was really going full tilt with the water mixable oils. I met with uh, curators at the Smithsonian who were doing studies at the time. There were several curators that were there. We talked about archival tendencies. I've educated myself on that. There's been papers and studies that were done on the advantages of water mixable and versus acrylic and, and so forth. And the studies were showing that the healthiest paint film is actually done with linseed oil, but that tends to yellow over time. And so you have to know the oil that your paint is used with. So walnut oil is a tiny bit softer oil, but it's a, it's a misnomer that is water mixable oil. People think cheap student grade, they're, they're artistic pigments and they're, there's no water in the paint. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm hijacking the conversation with this. I know there's a lot of information with it, but uh, there, you can educate yourself on that. And, and I have more resources on my, on my website. I hope that answered that question. And Christine did an ACO talk earlier last year uh, where she went over a lot of her practices in this too. So you can check that video out as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, any other questions from the, the group or the, the uh, audience? Do you guys see, or how, how have you guys seen over the years of being in these competitions and being involved with plein air? How, how have you seen it change? I think when most people think plein air, they, I mean, personally, immediately comes to mind, like Monet's paintings and things like that. How has plein air evolved since the, the, or, the origin of it, we'll, we'll say? Uh, I'd love to answer that. Yeah, um, I was going to say, Stuart, go for it. <laughs> I I think it's changed quite a bit. It it it's a from where I said it almost looks as though the competition pieces when you show up at the end, a lot of them look very very finished, very studio uh, like work. You spend several days on one painting to get it. I you know, and and they're magnificent. They're beautiful, and they usually take. Uh, big awards. Uh, I, I think I still like the spirit of the plein air thing. It's sort of almost like it's a one-off. It's the thing you did at that time and that place, and then you went to another place and did it. Um, so that I that I've seen change quite a bit. The scale of the paintings used to be like this. Now, uh, bigger seems to be better, and uh, and I think that puts a little bit of pressure on the painter that. Uh, just wants the portability of the work, you know, to get out there and paint. Uh, I think that there's, uh, so so those are, are things that I see evolving. Uh, and and then I think there's also a, maybe a tendency, which I like this direction, that it's not about a scene anymore, but it's a, more about just the, the material, uh, the materiality of paint that it's just there's some really really loose work being done it's almost on the verge of an abstraction but still it's it it resonates a sense of plein air and it's exciting to see so i see that that didn't used to be present this is something that's kind of coming up with the several artists that, that uh, i could mention but um, those three things i think are the biggest changes that i've seen yeah, I remember actually at one point I was just starting out and you said, I was at a, again, really included. I was invited to lunch with a bunch of the artists and I was just like, oh, all these like really cool artists that have been doing this, I, whether they'd been doing it for two years or whatever, like I'd read about them in magazines and, and so forth. And um, I remember the topic of 
is this plein air thing going to last? And I was kind of holding my breath, like, oh, I hope so, because this is really fun. And I, I remember Stuart being there and saying, I don't know, I think it needs to evolve a little bit more. And so I'm glad you answered that question, Stuart, because at the time I thought, oh, don't take this away from me universe because this is really great and I just enjoyed myself so much I felt myself growing as an artist as well that was really great any other questions from the the crew um I I know we've uh gone over but um it's it's been really fun to to talk to everybody I'll maybe we could do a quick anecdote uh, thing. I'll go first. Yes, I got chased by a bear in Telluride. And I think one of my favorite oh. plenary memories was I, I was, it was before I even was doing plenary per se as, as the circuit or any of that. I was in Seattle doing some watercolor and I was just sitting on the curb and just doing my thing because I was tired of, at the time, there was no digital reference. I was working from actual photos and I hated them. So I wanted to see into the shadows. And this couple walked by and he grabbed his wife's arm and he pointed to me like I was, a, I don't know, a sideshow. And he's like, look, honey, it's a real live artist. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's great. I'm alive. <laughs> I am an artist. I am not dead in a museum. Not yet at any rate. <laughs> so I thought that was fun. What did you do when you got chased by the bear? <laughs> oh yeah, my bear. <laughs> uh, I did all the wrong things. I sat in the car. I, I, I scurried. I ran to the car and because I was adjacent to the car. And then I thought, oh no, I left the hatch open. He could come right in. And so I got out and closed the hatch, which was really, really stupid, but I was <laughs> not thinking straight. And then later I was telling the organizers that I, I saw this bear and it was, it was, you know, coming at me because I had my glasses off to simplify shapes. And then I put on my glasses and I thought, Oh, that's not an antelope or something. That's a bear. Oh, and so <laughs> I shut the hatch and they said, actually, that was smart because you were in control of a big thing and you made a big noise. And so I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> Glad I did something right. But I'm such an idiot because I could have driven away even when the hatch opened. Yeah. I have one that everybody might relate to uh, living in the DC area. Um, it was when I was first starting out and my friend, uh, Sarah Poli, you might've heard of her, and I decided to go paint at Arlington uh, Cemetery. So we got permission to paint on the grounds and we decided to paint up in front of the Lee Mansion. And it was like almost five o'clock and there was nobody around. So we thought we were good. So we're setting up and of course my, I had a French easel then, the French easel leg collapsed, everything goes spilling out. I get that put that back together again and I'm, I'm getting ready. And then the wind comes up and my uh, roll of paper towel goes down the hill, you know, about 50 feet of it unraveling. So I <laughs> run down the hill to get my paper towel and I turn around to walk back up the hill and there are about 50 Japanese tourists sitting on the steps of the Lee Mansion snapping pictures of me. So, <laughs> so I'm sure oh I'm God. still a source of amusement in Japan. <laughs> You're probably the first viral uh, video on TikTok there, Nancy. <laughs> Let me know if you see it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Too funny. Uh, how about you, Stuart? Do you have any anecdotes? Well, those are great stories. I think mine's a uh that I can think of is that I was out painting uh, in a field. And I know people sometimes are self-conscious about painting in front of other people and having people come by and, and look while you're painting. And that sometimes makes me uncomfortable too, but it's part of the, the job. But anyway, I was out in a field, didn't think anybody would be there. And I'm, I'm painting away and I sort of glimpsed a figure that was behind me, just still as can be, not saying a word. And I keep painting, I keep painting. The person hasn't moved on. And uh, and I took like, all these thoughts about like almost 
you know, I should be performing in a way, you know, that I'm being, you know, uh, viewed so intently. And I painted and painted for maybe uh, half an hour or so. And then I, I kind of like glanced around and I realized the whole time that figure was only a stump of wood. <laughs> so I had this whole dialogue in my head uh, responding to a piece of wood. <laughs> so um, that just sort of taught me something about uh, performance and uh, having to show off and do something like that, that I had to like take to heart that that was a, now, it's funny. <laughs> Don't, you have to laugh at yourself sometimes. But. Well, that's a good one. Uh, I think Jill stepped out for a second, and uh, she's gonna she's gonna jump back on. Um, but uh, yes, I think what I would uh, just to wrap up maybe uh, what I was saying before that there is everybody should know that there is the possibility with the outlay of cash to attend these events as intoxicating as we make them sound. And they're, they're really great. Uh, there is always the chance, regardless of the quality of artists that you are, that you won't sell anything. And so you, I think a good, uh, even as to Stuart's point, you know, can you perform with people watching you, um, all of that stuff? Uh, if you mentally go into it as I'm on a retreat with painting friends, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to do the best that I can. It's a full week's immersion, being present, not knowing what you're going to do. So the icing on the cake would be if you make a sale and the icing on the cake would be if you won an award, but it's the experience itself. That is the reason that we do it because we never presume we're going to make a sale. Okay, Jill, we're doing anecdotes before we wrap everything up. So do you have any anecdotes you'd like to share, funny moments or just quirky things that happened? Well, you know, I think it's it's really a combination of all the all the stories for me. It's not any one in particular, but I think every, I, I have to say every single time I've gone out to Plenary Paint, there's always a little something that's not quite what I expected. So I would say to uh, those who would like to get out there or who do, um, to always expect the unexpected. <laughs> you just don't know what's going to happen um, or how, how you're going to have to adapt. And uh, so one of my uh, theories is always carry with you a, at least one or two bungee cords because you will, <laughs> you will never know uh, when a bungee cord can be your best, best friend. So I've used it for creating shade. I've used it to tie down um, my canvas, if it's larger, to hook up my uh, medium. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that's my little bit of advice. <laughs> well, that's great. And bulldog clips. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those too. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, thank you so much uh, to everybody, and especially Christine, uh, for really doing a fabulous job moderating uh, the event today. Um, uh, this was just absolutely phenomenal. And again, we want to thank uh, Montgomery Art Association for uh, sponsoring the event today. So uh, the page that you guys used to link to this uh, Zoom uh, talk also has links to Montgomery Art Association's um, web page as well, so you can join them and, and be involved with their incredible programming. Uh, so thank you to uh, Jen for uh, being a part of this today. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, in two weeks, we have an incredible uh, artist with Nicole M. Santiago. So uh, she is just, uh, she does something very different. She does figurative and interior-based uh, oil paintings, uh, but her work is astounding. So I encourage everyone to uh, join us uh, in two weeks. Uh, and do you have anything to add, Christine? Mariana? No, but uh, just to thank you again and thank the guests for being here. I really appreciate your time. And I, I know um, like Nancy's going on a trip tomorrow. And so just really happy it worked out. So thank you. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much to all of you. No, thank you. Okay. Thanks you guys. Thank you. This is such a treat. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. <laughs>